Chapter 9, The Prairie Schooner There's nothing colder than wind on the highway. The gusts kick up from cars and trucks that zoom by like we're invisible. Drivers looking straight ahead, making sure their eyes don't see us. I'm thinking it's a really stupid idea trying to hitch a ride when Worm nudges me and says, You can go home now if you want. I go, huh? She won't look at me because her eyes are red and she doesn't want me to see her crying. It isn't fair making you come with me. I'm the one who has to run away from you know who. She means her stepfather with all his lies about what really happened to her mom and what he might do to Worm if she stays. My brain hears her talking and goes, do it, donut head, go home, tell the truth and see what happens. My brain is really stupid sometimes because only a crud ball creep would leave an 11 year old girl all alone in the world running away from a bad news dude like the undertaker besides once you once we find her real father he can take over and make things right so it's not like i'm running away forever that's what i tell myself and i'm trying real hard to believe it guys who brag about how cool it is to hitchhike are a bunch of liars in the first place you have to stand there like roadkill while dirt blows up in your face also, your feet ache and your nose fills with the stink of smelly motors and hot tires, and you keep smiling and waving your stupid thumb and nobody cares, or nobody stops. Worm is fidgeting around and acting worried. Her face is so pale and you could count every freckle, and her eyes look nervous and scared. You got a book in there, right? I say, pointing to her at her backpack. Go ahead and read it. Let me worry about getting a ride. It's like she was waiting for permission. About two seconds later, she's got her nose in a book called A Wrinkle in Time. You'd think she was in a library instead of hanging around beside a highway. You can tell she's really good at reading no matter where she is or what's happening around her. There's this look on her face like she's not there at all. She's gone wherever the book takes her. Me, every time a truck goes by and smacks me in the face with a gust of stinky wind, it makes me feel dumber and dumber. Great idea, hitching a ride. Right up there with making firecrackers in the basement, or that time I put orange soda in a f goldfish bowl so the fish could have a drink. Finally, I get so desperate I try t um, praying, even though it's probably against the rules. Dear Lord, I'm praying, if you'll just make somebody stop and pick us up, I promise to be good and pray for more important things like ending wars and feeding all the hungry people and saving the planet and stuff. Your immediate servant, Maxwell T. Kane. It probably doesn't count as a miracle, but when I open my eyes, this old bus is pulling over into the breakdown lane, kicking up a cloud of dust. Hey, cool, Worm says, looking up from her book. When the dust clears, I see it isn't a bus exactly, like maybe it used to be a school bus until somebody painted over it with splotches of bright colors, ziggy stripes of yellow and zaggy patches of pink, and another color that looks like the inside of a ripe cantaloupe. It has curtains on the windows and a, bri and a big chrome air horn and the name in drippy purple paint on the side, the Prairie Schooner. I figure anybody who'd paint an old bus like this is probably insane, or at least dangerously wacko. I'm going to tell Worm to forget it. We'll wait for another ride, but it's too late. She's already running for the door. I catch up with her just as she's scrambling up the steps to the bus. Hang on, I'm panting. Wait a sec. I look up to where the driver sits. He's this old dude with silvery white hair braided into long pigtails and a huge lumpy nose that's not and not much chin. He's got a big wide smile and a Santa Claus fat belly, and he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt that hurts my eyes. It's that bright. But the strangest thing of all is his glasses. The lenses are as big around as coffee cups, and so thick his eyes look like they're coming at you through telescopes. Howdy doody, the old dude says. Welcome aboard. Have a seat and rest your feet. The door whacks shut behind me, and we're moving. He hits the horn, and a loud noise almost stops my heart. I'm staggering, trying to hold on to the bus as the bus speeds up, and Worm is looking around, going, I guess you live here, huh? Home sweet home, the driver says, and gives his horn another blast. The inside of the bus does look like home, in a funny way. The old passenger seats have been ripped out, and in the front part of the bus, there's a couple of old couches bolted to the floor. In the back is a stove and a sink and 
one of those little refrigerators and beyond that a couple of bunk beds built against the wall. I am trying to take it all in and keep my balance at the same time. Meanwhile, Worm settles down on the old couch and acts like everything is normal. The bus swerves and I fall onto the couch next to Worm. The driver hits the horn again and shouts, Make way! Coming through! Then he's looking at me in the rear view mirror and says, I'm the Dippy Hippie. Pleased to meet you. I go, huh? They call me the Dippy Hippie, he explains. Dip for short. I'm thinking maybe we should use made-up names, but before I can think of any, Worm looks up from her book and goes, I'm Rachel, and this is Max the Mighty. Rachel and Max, Dip says, groovy. He's got both hands on the big steering wheel, and he's keeping the bus square in the middle of the slow lane. You can tell he's a good driver, even if he is halfway blind, and there's something in his voice that makes me think maybe he's not so strange after all. Where are you folks headed? He asks. Any place special? Um, I say, because I'm not sure if it's a secret or not. Chivalry. Worm pops up. That's in Montana. Montana, huh? Dip nods to himself. I'm headed in that general direction, more or less. We'll see where the highway takes us. Make yourselves at home. If you're hungry, there's food in the refrigerator. Help yourself. Food sounds good, so I make me and the worm a couple of bologna sandwiches with plenty of mustard. I've got no problem finishing mine, but before worm gets halfway done, her head is nodding and her eyelids are fluttering, and then she kind of slumps over against me, fast asleep. She's hugging a wrinkle in time to her chest and breathing deep and quiet and looks so peaceful, and she looks so peaceful, it makes me feel sleepy too. The next thing I know, the bus has stopped moving and it's dark. Rest stop, a voice explained softly. All that snoring back there, I figured I'd better catch a few winks before I nodded off at the wheel. Dip is lying on the other couch. He's got his hands behind his head and I can't tell where he's looking because there's no lights on. Just a few stars shining in through the windshield. You want to tell me about it? He asks, real quiet. I don't know what to say, so I make up some lame story about how we missed the Greyhound bus and decided to try hitching a ride. Uh-huh, Dip says. Rachel's your sister, is that it? Not exactly, I say. He doesn't say anything for a while and then sits up and I can see him looking at us, looking at how the worm is sleeping so sound and comfortable on the old couch, like she was safe in her own home. Dip nods to himself and then says... Fact is, I'm grateful for the company. Big bus like this doesn't feel right empty. It is real nice, I say, looking around, and it is nice, even if it is old and sort of sh um, shabby. I'm a retired school teacher, Dip says. Me and the wife been plain, planning to take off and see the world like we always dreamed of doing but never had time. Then she passed away all of a sudden. Kind of caught me by surprise, you know. After a while, I got tired of feeling sorry for myself, so I finished fixing up the prairie schooner and took off. You know what a prairie schooner is, Max? No, I say. Dip sits up straighter, and his voice gets happy again. He tells me about how an old... In the old days, when the settlers headed out west, some of them rigged sails on their wagons and let the wind blow them onto the prairies, sailing through the fields of green, green grass, under a big blue sky, and all their lives in front of them, until they found a place and made it home. Is that where you're heading? I ask, out to the prairies? Wherever the wind takes me, he says, that's where I'm going. How's that sound to you? It sounds just fine, I say.